Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 127 of UAB Green and Told, original debut Monday, July 1st, 2024. Through this podcast, we're able to share stories from members of the UAB community. Want to listen into previous episodes of UAB's most downloaded podcast? Check us out at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told on Spotify or the Apple podcast app. While there, leave a written review that'll help other alums find us. I'm Greg Berry, a UAB alum and director of communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. William Penn once said, time is what we want most, but what we use worst. For today's podcast guest, however, time doesn't matter. That doesn't say he stays still. There's seemingly never a dull moment for Dr. Kenny Bramlett, but as he'll share, he'd rather not be watching the clock. I don't wear a watch. I eat when I'm hungry. I work when we need to. Very simple. And time means nothing to me, really. From mowing lawns to welding to health care, Kenny's story is full of twists and turns. You won't know what'll pop up during a conversation. But when I was younger, we trained horses at my grandparents. And then when I was in high school, I broke horses for people. So I've, I've always loved them. And as we'll touch on, Kenny is an orthopedic surgeon and works a lot. But if you ask him, that's okay. Because, you know, I don't, I don't mind working. This is the easiest job I've ever had. It's air conditioned, it's clean, I'm not in mud, I'm not smashing my finger with a hammer, I'm not getting stuff in my eyeball. A surgeon's craft is one that combines precision and finesse in order to perform the most intricate maneuvers when working on a patient. As doctors know well, having incredible dexterity is an important part of an operation. Sure, that's the case for Dr. Kenny Bramlett, but he's not your ordinary doctor. His story is amazing. Like many kids, he began cutting grass for about three or four bucks per lawn. Pretty normal, right? Well, that's where his story really begins. I got a job at the... uh... It's an ironworking shop over on um, Pinson, Alabama, which is a pretty industrial area town at that point. So I signed on as a sandblaster when I was 14. And I was sandblasting industrial cranes and conveyors and hoppers and stuff like that. So they let me start working. And when you put on a canvas back over your head, you got a little goggles that you put, keep your eyes from getting hit with sand. 150 pound of pressure on a hose like a fire hose and it blew sand out and you'd knock the rust off steel. So it was in hot sun. It was a nice 100 degrees with a nice bag over your head. The guy around the place was a guy named Marty Stringfellow. You know, he was very, very open to me and was admired the fact that I was working like I was. So I started learning how to weld because I'd see every weld anyway. And after about two, three months of that, he said, you, you can do this pretty good. I said, yeah, I'll, I want to weld. And so for about four years, I worked with him when all through high school, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, so I would cut steel, big steel. We only have about 30 foot pieces. Wow. Running, operate, picking up with a crane. You know, is is it heavy industrial, heavy industrial construction? So he and I would work, read the blueprints, cut the steel, tack everything together that needed to be done. And we'd pick it up, move it and set it down, and the guys would come in on Monday, finish welding it out, priming it, painting it, and by Friday, ship it out the door. And then Friday, I'd come in with him, and Marty and I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, cut, tack, read the blueprints, and just we, so we were in production in that way. And then I was riding. I was 15 at the time with a guy <clears throat> and uh, on a come back from a job over at Eastwood Mall. They were laying a pipeline at Century Plaza. That's when Century Plaza was being built. I, you know, I've always heard about the pipeline welding aspect because that's just another level of welding. It's like the neurosurgery of welding. Sure. Okay. So I said, let me out. So I got out and said, I'll call my mother to come pick me up. So I stayed there all day and I hung around and the next day I went back and hung around. So the guy finally, the guy who's running the job says, what do you want? I said, I want to work with you guys. This is cool stuff. And he finally said, what do you want, kid? I said, I want to learn how to do your job. He says, well, get down here. So I jumped in the ditch and I worked with him for the rest of the summer. So I, was, I became a pipeline welder when I was 15 years old. Did you weld throughout medical school too? Or did you take time? You did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How did you balance the two? I don't wear a watch. I eat when I'm hungry. 
I've worked with many too. Very simple. I'd, time means nothing to me, really. We would have class to two, and every afternoon I'd get off. They call me and said, "Hey, we got a pipe blowout in Pelham, or we got a somewhere Jasper." So at night I do heavy equipment repair. I put halogen lights on the back of my truck. I could flip them up about ten feet tall, turn them on. It's like daylight. So I would work till ten, two o'clock in the morning. Your peers had to know you were doing this. You know, most of the time when you're in a professional school like the School of Medicine, that's your focus. What did your peers think about you doing? It was my focus. I was a good student. Yeah. I mean, I'm just real efficient about how I use my time. And when I got my general surgery residency, internal medicine residency, my first year, my parents drafted me. You should quit doing this. You're gonna hurt yourself. And uh, I made a big mistake. I sold my truck. With everything that you did, welding, using your hands, did you see that kind of pay off in medical school, especially when it came to surgery? Because I imagine there's a lot of intricate welds that you have to do just like... No, no, no. no I'm, I'm telling you. Yes, the answer is certainly yes. I mean, I developed my own techniques for doing total knee, total hips, shoulder replacements. I developed my own techniques for doing things systematically. Because when you weld a pipeline, actually, strangely enough, there's more there's more uh, quality control on a cross-country pipeline than there is in a lot of aspects of an operating room. No kidding. No kidding. There's no mistake. You make one mistake, you know what happens? You're out of here. Goodbye. See you next job. Practice up, come back, see you later. That meticulous detail, and I could weld left-handed and right-handed. I could weld a joint 50% faster than most people could when I was young and flexible. You've just got a, a very interesting background. I mean, we've been talking about sandblasting and welding. Obviously, there's medical school, but I want to segue into the international experience that you okay. had because you wound up doing a fellowship in Germany. How did a kid from Falkville do that? Yeah. All right. So... Go to medical school. Medical school was fun. I enjoyed it. I had a really good time. So Kurt Neiman was the chairman. He liked rebuilding cars. Shocker. Orthopedic surgeon doing mechanic work. So he got became friends. I was a medical student. And he had a car that he couldn't fix the water pump on. Yep. When he was taken apart, he broke the flange off the water pump. My uh, colleague, chief resident, was John Kagan. He told us, hey, Dr. Neiman, do you know that? Bramlett over here, he's he's a welder. He says, what? He says, yeah, he welds on pipelines and all travels all over the damn south. He says, really? Didn't say another word. Next day, he shows up with a water pump wrapped in a rag in his pocket in his lab coat. And like a child, he goes, do you think you can fix this? I go like, sure, why not? So I fixed it. Brought it back to him, shiny, brushed down. Drove the car to work the next day. And then he says, come out and look at my car. I said, so cool. That was looked on pretty favorably, I think. Yeah. I was, I was into it and he knew that. And, but, you know, it just happened to be, I tell that story. That's, that's how I got in with Biggs. And I did my medical school in Huntsville. And the general surgeon up there was a guy named Charlie Sela. And Charlie Sela was brilliant general surgeon, super, super nice, great handed. He said, you know, you should do a fellowship. I have some contacts in Germany. And I said, well, I really thought about doing those travel fellowships. So I went through it and got a scholarship appointment and went to Germany for four or five months and uh, wanting to do orthopedics, obviously, that was my plan. But they put me, because I came from Birmingham, the guy, Hans Bors, who was the pump tech on the first first open heart surgery that DeBakey did in Houston. Now he's in Germany as the chairman of the Hanover Medical Center. I'm from Birmingham. He lived in Houston. I'm like brother to him. He treated me like his long lost adopted son. Incredible. He said, this was the first three days I was there. He says, you must come to surgery with me. I said, well, you know, I think it was about doing North Peace. Said, oh, no, 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 no. You do cardiovascular. So anyway, off we went. I think I'm going to go in there and just watch some cases. I was first assist. He was making his residents and fellows stand down to me. I'm pretty good on my feet. 
Hell, I pulled it off. Hell, I said, okay, let's go. It was top of the chain as far as experiences. It was incredible. I did uh, two more fellowships, one in the um, University of Colorado, mm -hmm. in hand and foot and arthritis reconstruction, hip, knee, foot, shoulder, et cetera. And then I was asked to be a, uh, on staff at Harvard because I did a lot of research also when I was coming through school. So that led me to the foreign side of things. Mm -hmm. So I did the I did the foreign surgery in Germany, you know, I did some time also, spent some time in London. But in the process of doing all the stuff, and I finished the mass general Harvard thing and came back here and I was like, man, I need to like just do some other stuff. But when I was younger, we trained horses at my grandparents. And then when I was in high school, I broke horses for people. So I've, I've always loved them. One of my contacts in Fairhope was uh, very involved in the, they played polo down there, you know, the polo operation in Fairhope, big time. And uh, it had been going up for a long time. And so I was down there one day, one weekend, someone out there, and they called and said, man, you should come over there and see what we're doing. I said, okay. So I went over there and some guy got hurt and they need another person. And he just happened to have a size nine boot and a seven and a half head. And so I got a helmet and boots and off I went. So we started playing. And that was 30 years ago. From the time grass turns green in April till July, and then from September to November, middle of November, we'd play every year. Then I kept going back to Point Clear and we would go to other places and and it would lead to this place and this place. And it was in Guatemala, I mean, Nicaragua. And then it was Texas, it was Louisiana. And I was in practice you know, with Jimmy Andrews and Larry Lee Mack and myself and Joe Sherrill. And we kind of, there's some others that came along, but we built this big practice called Alabama Sports Medicine. While I was in that process, I was playing polo and, you know, had lots of contacts in Argentina, went to Argentina a bunch of times, because that's the home of polo, really. All the best players come from Argentina. So I was down there playing and somebody, people get hurt and they'd come ask me, hey, 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 what about this? What about that? And uh, so when it's all said and done, I treated a couple of people down there, a couple of them from the Emirates. And then one day I get a call, this guy who was here in uh, Alabama, he was at the War College. Bert Montgomery has a War College. And people come from all over the world to Maxwell Air Force War College. I get a call from one of the brothers of one of the people I treated and said, hey, I'm in Montgomery and I'm, you treated my brother and I got a sore knee or something like that, whatever it was, I remember. Anyway, I said, okay, no problem. Well, so he comes up to Birmingham and we become contact friends and a lot in common. And he just happened to be the commanding general officer of the UAE Air Force. <laughs> And also a polo player. So he brought a couple of his friends from Argentina to Birmingham. And we went to my farm and played there. And then we became friends. And then so there he goes back after the war college time and says, yeah, my father's got all these problems. I said, what kind? I said, you will just have to come see. So they sent me a ticket. They'd done some research on, our, on my data because I produced, I, I published data what I do over the years. So they said, uh, we want you to come here and look at my father. Well, the father was one of the founders of United Arab Emirates, like wow. number two. <laughs> wow. And he had these six sons, and one of the sons was my contact. I go over there and see, I mean, I'm in a big conference. I mean, you cannot believe how engaging this was it's so interesting at every step so i go see the father he's got terrible knees he hadn't been able to quote use his bladder function appropriately in a long period of time i said i loaded him up brought him here <clears throat> having had a foley catheter for three years i had the foley catheter out of him in four days i was his dude i i, I was he was he, he liked me a lot Three weeks later, did a knee replacement on him. So he's got no catheter, both knees straight, he can walk, all systems go. And after that, they asked me to come back and come back and come back. And then 
I consulted on the building of a hospital they did over in Abu Dhabi. And uh, then I started going back every other month for two weeks. We'd do about 50 surgeries in a week. It was, it was, it was a, it's a challenge. It was a lot of work. But it was kind of always an intellectual interest to what was going on. I became very good friends with the host surgeon there. And we just became diligent friends. We have, we talk still once a week. I talked to my other uh, government contacts once a week or on WhatsApp all the time. And I have I do uh, interactive consults with them still on um, our website that I've created. And then because of the polo thing, I've taken care of a long list of international polo stars. It's been kind of crazy. It's been <laughs> crazy fun, crazy interesting, but intellectually um, super, super, super um, satisfying. Because you know, I don't, I don't mind working. This easiest job I've ever had. It's air conditioned. It's clean. I'm not in mud. I'm not smashing my finger with a hammer. I'm not getting stuff in my eyeball. It's very interesting, just the, the trajectory that your your career and and your life took, going from sandblasting to welding, and today you're even in kind of the tech world for healthcare. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that aspect of mm -hmm. your career. Yeah. What brought that on, and where is that today? Oh, I'm great. I'm glad to tell you. Okay, so the problem is in healthcare, the, the number one problem in healthcare in a general global sense is that people are poorly educated. And then there's so much information flooding through the internet, social media, social media trash, internet communication, that people are confused. They don't know this thing is dangerous. This thing's dangerous. It can give you good information and it can give you trash. How do you discern that? Years ago, having been at Mass General, having been at the University of Colorado, having been in Germany, Germans were pretty efficient. And if you smoked within a year, you had nicotine in your system within a year, you didn't get bypass surgery. They said, eh, you're out, goodbye. Because they just clutch your graft back off. Spend all this money and you're done. When I was at Mass General, total hip would stay six weeks in the hospital. I was chief resident for two years at UAB. And I'd got to do a lot of surgery because I was at Cooper Green for two years, almost by myself for two years. So I'd done a lot of surgery. Went to Mass General when I finished Colorado and finished Hanover and went to Mass General. They were doing this. I'm like, I was kind of like shaking my head going, wow, this is like crazy or interesting, but still it's not really, it's kind of overkill. So I came back, went to practice in Birmingham. And, you know, of course my wife has a baby and she goes home the next day. Eh, has another baby home the next day. Eh. Total hips are staying 16 days in the hospital. Well, I'd reduce total hip surgery, again, from what was a six-hour operation at Mass General by the guy who wrote the textbook in surgery, known worldwide. I'd reduce that to a 30-minute operation. Wow. And I actually was, they say, and I've not found anybody to contrary with me on this, but I was doing outpatient total hips in 1991, over 30 years ago. And it's the way right now, as you know, right? Robot, outpatient, wow, wow, outpatient surgery centers, all that stuff. That's all cool. But I was doing that. I developed that system to do that called Orthopace way back then. And it was syndicated worldwide, the system I created of how to be efficient. And I am that, okay? But it's not fast. Speed is a byproduct of efficiency. Efficiency is not a byproduct of random speed can't drive a car or you'll wreck if you try to go too fast. Mm -hmm. You got to be a good driver first. The education was a limitation. So I developed what was prehabilitation. No one ever talked about prehabilitation. We all talked about rehabilitation. So prehabilitation was a proactive means, quote, making patient a super patient. So I developed a card system that had the top 10 comorbidities that caused problems in the top 10 modifiable conditions, weight, diabetic profile, smoking, tobacco, health education, age, and exercise. Those had to be identified. And then beyond that, score out within a time period of 12 months or greater, history of blood clot, cancer, stroke, heart attack, pacemaker, heart stent, HPF, diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease. So you didn't score it. If you scored over 15, we put you off and prehabilitate you more aggressively, lose weight, modify your conditions, 
see your urologist, get a stent to avoid complications. So it decreased our complications post-op drastically. Two standard deviations from the norm. Because then we went to myorthopedicproblem.com. So there's a site we created, and we're in that engagement right now, where you can go to the site, answer a series of 14 questions, and through AI and machine learning, it'll give you an 85 to 93% accuracy of what your condition is, involving the top 130 conditions in orthopedics, which covers pretty much the damn map. If it's you know osteosarcoma of the little finger, you're not gonna get it on that website. But if it's a sprained ankle grade two, what to do with it, because you're in Montana, you don't want to run to the doctor in Denver, hey, may be good to you. So we developed that. And now we've been, we've converted to a telemed product as well. So you can talk to a therapist, a surgeon, physical therapist, a trainer, 24-7. So that's my last endeavor, so to speak. And I've been working on this for about a decade. So that's what we're doing. That's where the, the IT connectivity comes through. But patient education is the weakest link in healthcare because you don't get paid for it. You don't get paid for it. So there's no incentive to do it. That is why a feature percent of first orthopedic diagnoses, guess what? Are incorrect. Feature percent, that's not that's not a good number. No. So a feature percent of the diagnoses are not dead on. That means let's say cut it back. 25% of the imaging may be not the right thing, which means 25% of the surgeries may not be the right thing which means the outcome might not be the right thing. So random plus random plus random plus random multiplied by each other gives you more random. Not to say people are doing wrong or not smart. Poor education, poor linkage, poor information exchanged. It's just the way the system works. So it's been a really engaging process. We're, we're processing somewhere between 60 to 100,000 people a month. That's Dr. Kenny Bramlett. Dr. Bramlett was awarded his MD from the Hearsing School of Medicine in 1981 and completed his residency in orthopedic surgery there in 1986. As a longtime member of the UAV community, he definitely has an idea of what it means to be a blazer. There's no comparison of the opportunity that was afforded to me by Henry Hoffman, who was head of admissions, Sarah Davis, who was the pediatrician there at Children's Hospital, Sarah Finley. Those people were so nice to me, recognizing that I wanted to be a physician. She studied hard, merit graded, did you what you're supposed to do, you get in medical school. My parents didn't go to college. Nobody I know went to college at that point in my life that I knew, other than my friends, dad and father and uh, Gulf Breeze. So I was very fortunate. So, and look what they've done. I mean, the, the university is top 10 in the world, you know? Be sure to check out past episodes of the UAB Green and Told podcast. Listen in at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Have a story to share or know someone who does? Email green and told at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on social media. Just search UAB alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for listening. And until next time, Go Blazers.